Pace as the engine RPM comes up to about uh, 1,500 or so, the clutches start to lock up. And then uh, maybe about 300 RPM later, they're locked. And it, it really allows them to do these nice smooth launches that you see. And, uh, it, you know, additionally on the engine, we wanted to make sure that it idled at a very low speed because um, you want to do what we call a virtual track walk or a real track walk. You know, in traditional driving, uh, racing, the drivers and the teams will go out and walk the track and talk about all the details. In driverless racing, you really need to be able to map the surface with the same sensors you're going to race with, uh, similar to a track walk. And so uh, we spent a lot of time trying to make sure that the engine could, could run uh, at low engine speed so that we could drive the vehicle as a, at as low a speed as possible. And that's not something you traditionally think about in racing, right? Let's make the car both fast and slow at the same time. And it was a, a pretty difficult challenge, but I, I think it's been achieved. You can see they're rolling, they were rolling around, uh, uh, you know, around like 20 miles an hour earlier, and that uh, has worked out quite well. Looks like Cavalier is out on the course. Yes, indeed. Cavalier Autonomous Racing. This is the Kais team coming to a stop right by their pit box. So mission accomplished there. Their time now officially registered as the third fastest of three. This UVA team comes in with a lot of experience at the helm because the uh, gentleman who oversees this program, he has been participating in autonomous racing for a long time. More on that story in a moment, but first down to Katie to hear from Keist. So much to be proud of. Oh, absolutely. They just, uh, they really did it. They, they, they beat what they uh, expected they could do. It's exactly what you wanted to see out of them. They've really been a solid team all along. Even when the when everything started out, they, they really stepped in to help hand over the vehicles and learn them and uh, been just an outstanding team to have as part of this competition. As mentioned, Cavalier Autonomous Racing, their team lead, a professor at UVA, Madur Bale, who 10 years ago came up with the idea for racing one-tenth scale autonomous cars. He called it F1 tenth, as he's a huge Formula One fan, and it has taken off. And he said, at that time, my dream was this, what you're seeing here, full-scale autonomous race cars on real-world racetracks and his UVA program has managed to do exactly that. Yeah, and Mater has a lot of great energy. I would be a great person to work for. I just really, really um, happy to see him here. And it's also interesting to see that a lot of the other teams have competed in his F110 competitions. Yeah, a lot of these up and down the grid have experience with that. Certainly, some of the European teams have been competitors against him at various times as the Cavalier team is on it, headed down to turn number one. Their first timed lap at the Indy Autonomous Challenge. What does the warm-up lap look like? Well, they hit a max speed of 123 miles an hour, so they are really going well right now. This is really looking strong. Very strong indeed. 123.404 was the top speed set on that warm-up lap and looking pretty sporty through the south end of the racetrack. Absolutely. Hit right down on the white line, right on the line that they wanted to be on. This is where it all started for Mater, who we were talking about earlier, his first autonomous race car for F110, and he brought it here. This is the mascot for the Cavaliers this weekend. What a cool story, and you cannot wipe the smile off his face, and he's certainly not unique in that sentiment. Absolutely, and his car is, is looking outstanding on the track. Uh, up over 120 miles an hour again through the corners. Really, really looking strong. This is maybe a team that has been under the radar throughout the course of the week, but looking competitive right now. They need to beat Keist's time to make it into the top three, which will advance on to the shootout at the end of the day to the Yard of Bricks. There's the white flag waved by Spot, and the first timed lap comes out to 119.834 miles per hour. That would provisionally be fast enough to make the top three. Cavalier Autonomous Racing, though, with still two miles left on their first run. And I think something really clicked for this team on Thursday. They just really seemed to kind of relax and get into, into, into the right pace, and all of a sudden their speeds picked way up. And, and today they, they really said they were going to try to go after something special and set their own personal records as the fastest they've ever gone, and I think they're doing it right now. Madra told me that his goal for this event was to affect the public perception of autonomous driving. If these cars can drive on their own around a racetrack in conditions like these at up over 100 miles per hour, what then 
can an autonomous car do on the road? And clearly we're seeing something that is very much at the forefront of a new developing technology. Here comes Cavalier Autonomous Racing onto the front straightaway, accelerating out of turn number four, up over 120 miles per hour. The first lap at a shade under 119 on average. The second time by that speed, 119.933 miles per hour. The average speed, 119.883 miles per hour, provisionally good enough for third. Really did outstanding there. It looks like they're going to come around and uh, stop and do the obstacle avoidance. Really took a good line around the track and really low down in the corners and uh, ran the shortest distance they could. And I think it paid off for them in a, in a, in a top three speed here. So this is, uh, looks like we may be seeing them this afternoon a little bit later. And keep in mind, this is very much a race into the unknown for these teams because after the two spins on Thursday, Oh, we got some reports of precipitation in the pit lane, so some of the covers come over the race cars. Might have been an interesting moment there for this team if they were feeling raindrops while it was out on track and they kept the pedal down. Yeah, absolutely. These uh, hot, slick tires did definitely do not like the rain. Um, so, yeah, I think... Uh, We'll see if they abort this or not, or if they're going to keep going through the obstacle detection. I'm not sure. I'll have to keep an eye on that. But back to the story, the organizers effectively mandated some changes in setup. And barring a very brief practice window this morning, which very few teams were able to get out on track for, no one really has turned laps with these cars in these configurations. Right, exactly. That what they found on the two crashes are that uh, the two spins really that happened. Oh, it looks like they're coming through. The two spins is that they the cars were were heavy into oversteer, or the tail end of the car stepped out, and so they the organizers got together and spoke with all the technical experts uh, at Delara and and the race teams and I uh, decided to add a little bit more rear downforce into the vehicles to keep them stuck to the track and hopefully allow them to, to get through the corners a little bit faster and push that limit even further, but nobody knows what that limit is at this point. So now for the obstacle avoidance portion of the run, which is not timed, it's simply pass or fail through past the initial set of obstacles without trouble, able to avoid the second one without any drama as well, and so now Cavalier Autonomous Racing can celebrate. They just need to make it back to the pits and park. And their job is done right now, fast enough to make it into the shootout. Yeah, they did. A, uh, the the obstacle avoidance was really good there. It was kind of interesting to see. They made the they made sort of an S turn, but they didn't try to go back to the center of the track. They just kind of kept the car close to the pit wall and, and moved on. So that was a, a really good plan, I think, on their part to not try to overdo it and potentially spin the car, trying to recorrect back onto the optimal race line. Great job by them. When we see the car headed into obstacle avoidance, what sensors are the teams really utilizing to clear that portion of the challenge? Sure, the, it's going to be a combination of the, uh, at least for, for now, what they've been using are the either the radars or uh, radars and the LIDARs. It seems like most of the teams have leaned toward uh, using the LIDARs um, you know, to, to really identify exactly where the obstacle is, although the radars are also capable. So there's kind of a combination through the garage area of, of who is using what. Um, although I think the best strategy, and it, which also seems like several of the teams are using, is kind of fusing those, those sensors together or using the data streams together to, to make sure that you have confidence in those location um, of those obstacles on both. So if they're both agreeing with each other, that's great. Then you have really high confidence you know where these obstacles are. Is that what the teams are talking about when they're talking about redundancy? Yeah, absolutely. You, you, you bring in this information, you perceive this information from multiple locations. You could also use it with the camera as well. But one of the things that's kind of interesting, the teams, um, they, they were training AI, AI algorithms uh, to do image processing around Indy cars and looking for other cars, right? Other AV21 cars out on the track. And, and uh, recently they went to, the, to this strategy where we're going to put these obstacles out there and they look very different than indie cars and so uh, it, it probably meant a lot of their their camera software you know the ai software that they wrote for their cameras wasn't really ready for this although uh, they did do a bunch of practice runs over the past few days so it's certainly possible that the teams went home and, and uh, took all the, the camera record the recorded camera data that they 
that they have and started training new algorithms based on these obstacles. So they're also very reliable sensors to use in this application. Hopefully the precipitation is light. We did see in the forecast the chance for some scattered rain showers. Of course, anyone who's familiar with racing here at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway is aware that uh, rain on the racetrack on the oval is not a good thing. And speaking of not a good thing, this car should have been making its way down the pit lane, Rob. Yeah, um, they may have. So the way that they bring the cars into pit lane uh, race control issues a, a black flag to the car, and that tells it to go on a path where it's going to hit into the pit lane. And it may very well have happened here that they received that, that flag a little late or, or they didn't obey it for some reason. Maybe they didn't feel like it was safe to actually pit that time around. Uh, I'm not exactly sure here, but that may very well have been what happened. You even have to do this in traditional racing if your team asks you to come in and pit and you're too close to the entrance of pit lane, you really have to go around another time. That's probably what happened in this case. Now my question to you, and you may or may not know this answer, mm -hmm. so apologies in advance if I'm putting you on the spot. If it is determined that the black flag was issued at the appropriate time, does this constitute a failure to complete the challenge of coming to the pit lane and stopping by the pit box? Boy, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I can I can read that anyway. They say they say you just have to make a safe stop adjacent to your pit box. Maybe I'm not sure if it's written in the rules that you have to do it exactly on that lap or not. So it'll be interesting to see the debate that will go on around this. Uh, but I think as long as they come in and pit, I would I would guess they'll be okay. But this is. Uh, uh, really will be uh, kind of finally reading the rules and trying to understand it almost as a lawyer here to see to see what happens because they put an awesome uh, lap time up on the board. This is an interesting mix on this program of faculty as well as students from the University of Virginia and again Modder Bell who heads up this team. He's been dreaming of this day for a very very long time. An update on Cavalier Autonomous Racing now with Katie. And Ryan, I was just listening to Madur and some of his teammates with Cavalier Autonomous Racing trying to figure out what happened with the car and some of the team members mentioned, well, I think the car just switched to cool down lap mode instead of coming to pit lane mode. So Rob, what's the difference in those two algorithms? Yeah, the pit lane mode basically redirects it through the GPS systems. It says, okay, follow a different path. And so cool down mode is really just kind of slow down like you traditionally do when a caution flag comes out and run the, you know, run still the traditional race line, but a, but a pit mode will say, okay, I need to run a different line or my target line is a different line, which is going to be entering the pit lane through the exit, you know, at the exit of turn four. So it's just a difference in lines that they were, that they were commanding. So we'll see if they come in here. A lot of eyes on this race car, which stays to go. the right, but yep. now starting to come back to the pit lane entry. That is good news, and now we'll leave it to race control to determine whether or not this checks all the appropriate boxes. But great speed out of this team, which checked in third fastest of the four that have set times here so far, but a big jump for them, kind of like we saw from Keist achieving speeds that we had not seen from them previously. Yeah, it's race day and there's a big check at the end of it. So they're def definitely doing what, what you'd expect here. It's been, you know, they, they've, they've really ramped up over the last few weeks and as the, the algorithms have become uh, uh, better and better and improved. You could see this car was incredibly stable when it ran, went around the track. It never had a moment where you were concerned at all. It was, it was always tracking the line it wanted uh, pretty much exactly and when you get to that point really the main thing there is just how much risk do you want to take you just keep bumping up the speeds until potentially you get back to those control issues so it's just a slow progression of, of steps and, and they're really in that mode now where they're in this this pretty rapid speed up as uh, things are looking really stable the car has come to a stop and Katie has more and I think there is now some relief here at Cavalier Autonomous Racing. Let's check in with Maduro real quick. What happened on that lap where your car was supposed to come to the pits? That's right. So uh, we were on our cool down lap because the previous lap was pretty fast. And uh, we didn't slow down enough to make that safe maneuver into the pit. So the car decided to slow down using one more lap. Yeah. But then it came and stopped automatically. Still a successful run for Cavalier Autonomous Racing, and in your hands now is the F110 car that you created. When we spoke earlier this week, you talked about this being the realization of a dream. How much relief are you now feeling seeing that car parked here on pit lane? 
Yeah, I'll be honest. I, I was a little anxious because uh, we were really pushing today, and you know the track is a little bit cold as well. So uh, we are happy with our run. It went really fast, and yes, you are right. You know this is absolutely where it started, and then behind me is the the full scale Indy autonomous race car. It doesn't get any better than this. Yep. On Thursday during practice, your team made a lot of improvements. What did you find? Yeah, it's all about you know like. A, a race car is never a finished product. You never come to race day and say, okay, we are all set, nothing will go wrong. There's always room to improve. I can go back and make improvements right now. So we had, you know, we were trying different race lines, different aggressive lines, so we had to try them out. Uh, we tried obstacle avoidance, improving that, which worked really perfectly today. So it's all about, you know, analyzing the data and making these small, very surgical improvements to a software. and. Uh, it, in the last week, in the last few days, it has all come together for us and given us the confidence to push our car today. Speaking of taking next steps, you've got F110 car, the Indy Autonomous Challenge car just over pit wall here. What's next for the University of Virginia? What's next for the university? And I think what's next for autonomous racing is really to keep pushing, right? This is the beginning of something really exciting. I can assure you, you will have multiple cars racing each other, just like in Indy 500. And my personal ambition is in three to five years' time, I'm going to challenge the winner of the Indy 500 for a head-to-head -head race and see what happens. What a sight that would be, right, Ryan and Rob? My goodness, the gauntlet has been thrown down, and what a huge statement that is about the confidence in this technology and the future it has. Yeah, and you know what, he's... Uh... You know, he's, he's a super inspirational person to thousands of students, right? And, and uh, it's great to hear him say that, you know, because he, he really does believe in this and, and uh, he may very well be right. I wouldn't count him out.